The sermon tonight is going to be built around Matthew chapter 22, (laughs) verses 37 to 39, and I'll be reading from the American Standard Translation from 1901. And he said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, with all thy mind. This is the great and first commandment. And the second, like unto it, is this, Thou shalt love the, thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments the whole law hangeth, and the prophets. You know, sometimes we have typos. Sometimes things don't always run as smooth as you want them to. You know, it's really nice to be able to walk into an auditorium and have a seat and and everything just click and run smoothly, slides transition just when they're supposed to, and all that kind of stuff. There's a lot of stuff that goes on behind the scenes to make a service come off as smoothly as it does. And there's a lot of people who work and serve behind the scenes to make that happen. But you know, at the end of the day, we're here to look at God's Word and to look at what God's Word has to say. And tonight, we're going to begin a a series about discipleship. And I asked the question this morning, how many of you have heard a series on discipleship? And there was a number of people whose hands went up. You know, I haven't heard a whole lot of sermon series. I've heard sermons on it. But I haven't heard a lot of sermon series dedicated to discipleship. And I think this is something that's very important for us to remember and to consider in these times in which we're living. I was looking on social media the other day, and you know how you'll see somebody post something about, you know, this day in 1972, and it'll show like a newspaper thing, and it'll tell you the cost of bread and the hourly wage and the cost of a house and all this other kind of stuff. I saw that just a couple of days ago on this day in 1972. And one of the headlines was, Surgeon General and government determined that violence in television has lasting effects on children. 1972. Can we say that they were correct? Absolutely. And so when you get into discipleship and you start looking at the impressions that we make upon people, especially our children, it's vitally important that that we become men and women of tears. And what I mean by that, as believers, we need to be men and women who are committed to the teachings, the example of Jesus, accompanied by the relationships and the sacrifice of Jesus. We need to be men and women of tears. And so that's what we're going to look at in this series over the next several weeks. In fact, we're going to take the whole summer to do it. And this week, we're going to, we're going to build upon the foundation of the passage uh, that's very familiar to us that I read just a moment ago. You remember the situation. A lawyer comes to Jesus and asks him, Teacher, what is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus tells him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind with all your strength, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself, all the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. We're going to build off of that. And next week, we're going to continue building as we look at more of Jesus' teachings. But this is the central teaching of Jesus Christ. He says there are no more important commandments than these two. And so that's where we're going to start this evening with this series. Let me ask you a quick question before we go any further. In our last series on the Church of the Bible, we had, we had a, work, a workbook that basically went along with that. Just want to ask the question. I didn't tell Jackie I was going to do this because it will make a lot more work for her. But how many of you would be interested in something similar for this series? All right. Oh, okay, Jay. Oh, Jackie too. Okay, cool. All right, good. We'll put that together. We'll put that together. Okay. Um, Let's go to God in prayer. Lord, we thank you so much for bringing us back together tonight. Thank you for everyone who has made the decision to be here to, to learn more and to deepen their discipleship. That's important. It's important because we need more disciples. Not just disciples in name only. 
We need real disciples. We need people who want to be real about following the teachings of your son, following the example of your son, but not stopping there. Taking it a step further and making the teachings and example of Jesus more meaningful in the relationships that we build and the sacrifices that we make. And so, Father, I ask that you will be with us during this study throughout this summer, that we'll take what we learn and share it with someone else and encourage someone else to be a part of what we have going on. The world is in need of real disciples now. And so, Lord, <clears throat> Spirit, we ask that, that this message will be yours, that you will speak in a very real and powerful way to us. Spirit, we ask that you humble us. Help us to see something we've never seen before. Help us to dig deeper into who you've created us to be. Help us to be stronger disciples on the teachings of Jesus through this study and our study next week on Jesus' teachings. Lord, we love you and we thank you. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. How many of you have known people that at their passing, you shed tears for them? Have y'all ever known anybody like that? I'm sure that you've probably known several. If you've been involved in this congregation or been a believer for any number of years, you've known a number of people like that. And so the question I have to ask next is, what was it about that person in their life that brought you to tears? Think about that for just a second. What was it about this amazing man or, or woman of faith that when they pass from this life and into their reward that just brought you to tears? What was it about them? Family, the death of any man or any woman is a sad occasion. But sometimes we shed tears of regret at those times because of the potential that a young person was never able to achieve. We also shed tears of regret for men and for women who lived many years, but they didn't live a full life because they squandered their potential. But you know what? We shed tears of joy for those who displayed these aspects of Jesus in their discipleship that we're going to look at over the course of this study together in this series. Let me ask you a question, and it's an important one. Have you ever considered the legacy and the memory that you want to leave for those who follow you? What will be said of you at your funeral? Will your name and your example be shared by one of your brother's or sisters in Christ at your funeral in some, at some time in the future? Will those who know you and those who love you be able to say that you were a man or a woman who lived and shared the teachings of Jesus, the example of Jesus, the relationships and sacrifices of Jesus in your time on this earth? I hope so. I really hope so. Family, it's important. It's important. Because our life and our example and our discipleship is vital to the growth of the church. The famous Baptist preacher Charles Spurgeon once said this. He said, a man's life is always more forcible than his speech. When men take stock of him, they reckon his deeds as dollars and his words as pennies. If his life and doctrine disagree, the mass of onlookers accept his practice and reject his preaching. Family, what Spurgeon says is true. People are going to pay way more attention to the things that we do than the things that we ever say. I can deliver sermons that are fair to middling, maybe good once in a while. But people are going to know me more for the things that I do rather than the things that I say. And that's appropriate. But here's the thing. 
What Spurgeon says, in fact, has been too true for followers of Jesus for too long. And has contributed to the condition that our country is in right now. I hate to quote a politician, but Christians have been all talk and no action for too long. As followers of Jesus, we've been called. You have been called. I have been called. We have been called to be men and women of tears. Disciples who live and share the teachings of Jesus, the example of Jesus, accompanied by the relationships and the sacrifice of Jesus. And every one of us can think of a brother or a sister. You did it just a minute ago. You probably very quickly can bring up another one in your mind. We all can think of a brother or sister whose life and example brings tears of thankfulness and remembrance to our eyes for their discipleship. That's what brings you to tears. It's their discipleship. And the reason why is because all of these areas of Jesus' life are not only embraced by them, they pass them on to you. As Christian men and women, we have a responsibility. We have a responsibility as believers to embrace our discipleship in Jesus. And it's found in His teachings and His example. But also, we have to take it to the next level. We have to be willing to embrace His teachings and His example and take it to the next level that I see so many believers not doing, that have failed to do by accompanying those teachings and His example with relationships and sacrifice. Family, we all have known people. We've all known people who are outstanding teachers and set a good example of what they taught. But I have to be honest with you, they were what I would call unapproachable and unrelatable people. And there are a lot of reasons why. And one of the reasons why I think is very obvious. We live in a society today that seeks to keep people at arm's length. Now, why is that? Why do you think that is? Today, most people, even Christian people, are not willing to invest the time, the resources, the energy, or the emotion in going to the next level of strong relationships and selfless sacrifice. As Christian men and women has, who claim to be followers of Jesus, as our Lord and Savior and mentor, we've been called. We have to answer it. We have been called to do more. We've been called to give more. We've been called to be more. When, and we've been called to expect more of one another. By living and sharing Jesus. So let's begin by looking at growing in our discipleship through Jesus' teachings. Every aspect of Jesus' life, every aspect is full of teaching moments. But there's five areas, family, that I want to focus on over the next two weeks. And the first point that I want to look at is what he shows us about loving the Lord, about loving our neighbor, and about loving ourselves. That's where you have to start with Jesus, I think. And this will be our base text, this text that we looked at this evening. This will be our base text, and this will be our foundational point that we will build from tonight and next Sunday evening to our discipleship regarding the teachings of Jesus. And so family, take a look at Matthew chapter 22, verses 34 to 40. You're going to have to turn in your Bibles because we don't have a slide. So pull that up on your phone or turn, turn, turn in, your, in your Bibles to that and hear the pages rustle. That's always a good sound. 
Flip over to Matthew chapter 22, verses 34 to 40, and notice what Matthew says. It says, But when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced, he being Jesus, had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. And one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. So take a good hard look at what Jesus says there and what Matthew records. We can see that the Sadducees had already taken their pot shots at Jesus. They had already gone and gave it their best shot at Jesus. Now it was the Pharisees' turn. And this is a prime example, family, of what will happen when you make the decision to become a man or a woman of God. This is a prime example of what will happen when you decide to get off the bench and get into the game. When that happens, you become a target. And what you see in this text are people who really didn't care for one another. The Pharisees and the Sadducees, they weren't chummy at all. These are people who really didn't care for one another, getting together to take somebody out that they considered a common enemy. And I've seen it many times in our culture today, and so have you. When it comes to Christian men and women standing up for their faith, you see, the Pharisees believed in the supernatural. The Sadducees didn't. The Pharisees believed in the resurrection of the dead. They believed in angels. They believed in demons. But the Sadducees didn't. The Pharisees and the Sadducees had fierce arguments over these issues. They did not agree on these issues at all. But they both viewed Jesus as a common threat and a common enemy. And so they laid their differences aside to take him out. In other words, they had adopted a saying that developed between the 2nd century B.C. and the 3rd century A.D. from an Indian Sanskrit text written by an economist and a philosopher named Cotillion. And this document was known as the Athrashastra. And it says this. The enemy of my enemy is my friend. Again, what we see happening here in the text and with people today who disagree, but they disagree more with Christians. Have you noticed that? People disagree, but they disagree with Christians more, and they come together against believers, especially on social media. So as the text says, the Sadducees had taken their swing at Jesus and they had struck out. And so now it was the Pharisees' turn at bat. And they send one of their heavy hitter lawyers to Jesus to ask him this question. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? Seems like a simple enough question, doesn't it? Now, the leaders in Israel, whether they be the Pharisees or whether they be the Sadducees, they never, ever ask Jesus a question without an ulterior motive to trip him up. And Jesus answers the question. He answers the question by saying, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. Jesus passed the test with flying colors. Jesus passed the test. He answered the question correctly. He satisfied the curiosity on this point, and he could have walked away right then. But he didn't. He took it to the next level and gave this lawyer more than he asked for. The lawyer only asked about the greatest commandment. That's all he asked about. 
But Jesus, in a spiritual sense, not only walks a mile with this lawyer, he walks with him too by giving him and the audience that put him up to the question something else to ponder. He reveals to them a second commandment of equal value to the first and a consequence of keeping them both. Jesus says, and the second is like it, like it, equal to it. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. In Luke's accounting to Theophilus of what some believe to be the very same encounter, Jesus, in response to the lawyer in Luke chapter 10, illustrates his point. Do you remember how he illustrated it? He illustrates it in what we know as the story of the Good Samaritan. Now, I assume that we're all familiar with that story. In case you're not, it's it's found only in Luke's gospel. And it's found in chapter 10, verses 25 to 37. Family, the only reason we have the story of the Good Samaritan is because this self-righteous lawyer asks The question in Luke chapter 10, verse 29. And Luke says, but he desiring to justify himself said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? I wonder how he said that. We just have text. We just have print. What was his voice inflection? What was his facial expression? What was the tone of his voice? Was he genuinely inquisitive? Or was he kind of being sarcastic? And who is my neighbor? If you're there in the text, take a good look at that. But he desiring to justify himself. What does that mean? It means he wants to make sure that he's got all his bases covered. He's a lawyer. He wants to make all the I's are dotted and all the T's are crossed. He wants to make sure that he has all of his bases covered. Family, don't miss this. If we live our Christian life just wanting to cover the bases, then we have cut the hope of Jesus short. Not only for ourselves, that's bad enough, but for those we have the opportunity to influence through our discipleship. Jesus says you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. Okay, what does that look like? In a 21st century context, what does that look like? We can't just read the scriptures and say, okay, that's great, and move on. No, we have to take it further. What does it look like? How do we apply that? How do we make the word live In our life. Ask yourself that question in your mind. What does that look like in my life? Do what a disciple would do. Ask yourself the question. What does that look like in my everyday life? What does it look like to love the Lord in that way? And how does that set the table for your personal discipleship? Now, Jesus again goes on to say, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. According to Jesus, what does loving your neighbor as yourself look like? The world needs an answer to that question. The society we live in needs an answer to that question. What does loving our neighbor as ourself look like? look like and why would loving ourselves being in be an integral part of being effective disciples how did the story of the good samaritan differ from what the lawyer conceived loving his neighbor look like you think it was different oh yes it was It was very different and we can step back and we can look at this self-righteous lawyer And we can look at all his shortcomings and we can pick him apart. 
now put ourselves in his place. Ooh. Does loving our neighbor as ourselves look different than what we conceive it to be? Just like he did. Family, what is the real world application for this today in our discipleship? And how does that inspire the hope of Jesus and those around us? Because that's a part of what our discipleship is all about. If we're not living life in such a way as a disciple, as a follower of Jesus Christ, and nobody notices, then what's the point? We're not out there to get attention for us. We're out there to lead people to Jesus. That's a part of what our discipleship is all about. An example of Jesus to others. Also something we may not consider when we think about this is the qualifier that Jesus places on loving our neighbor. Notice that Jesus doesn't say, love your neighbor as you love me. Doesn't say that. He could have. He could have and he'd been justified in saying so. In fact, he would have been correct in saying so. But he didn't say that. He didn't say, love your neighbor as you love me. He didn't say, love your neighbor as you love the Lord. Jesus says, love your neighbor as you love yourself. So family, how are we supposed to do that? How are we supposed to love ourselves we live in a world today that can't answer that question we live in a world where people struggle just to even like themselves let alone love themselves why because satan has been putting in overtime what does it look like to love your neighbor as yourself? And how are we to love ourselves? And how does that translate applicably to loving our neighbors? How does loving ourselves translate to loving the person next to us? Again, those are discipleship questions that need to be answered. And the reason why is because those questions are foundational. Those questions are foundational to our discipleship as followers of Jesus and as influencers in the lives of others for the cause of Christ. As disciples, we can't go anywhere until we figure this one out. That's why we had to start here. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and love your neighbor, as you love yourself. If you can't love yourself, you can't love your neighbor. But it all starts by loving God first. And so in order to become men and women of tears, to be real disciples of Christ, then Jesus must be Lord of all. And if he's not, then you can't go any further. We've been called to become men and women of tears. When I announced this series this morning, I hoped that it'd be standing room only in here. It's a preacher thing. But I knew good and well that it wouldn't be. Think about that person, that man or that woman, again, that you've shed tears over. Think about those people. And I know there's more than one. But can you count them on your fingers with fingers to spare? I can. And so can you. We've known, I've known a lot of good people in my life. A lot of good people. But there's only a handful of people that I have known that I would consider to be men and women of tears. Men and women that embraced the teachings of Jesus. Men and women that tried to follow the example of Jesus. But they didn't stop there. 
They took the teachings and the example of Jesus and they carried it over into their relationships with other people. You know the people I'm talking about? And then when it came right down to it, in many different situations, they were willing to make the sacrifice of Christ in their life. For their family, for their friends, for the church, for their community. We're talking about a very special group of people. These are true disciples. These are men and women of tears. And their example is what we've been called to. In fact, I believe if I know them, and if you know them, they would tell us, do better. Can you hear them? They would say, do better. Because I believe in you. Can you hear them? That's what we've been called to. But the Lord has to be Lord of all. And if He's not Lord of all in your life tonight, you cannot be the disciple that Jesus calls you to be. And if you need us to pray with you tonight about that so you can turn loose of whatever it is that's holding you down as a believer, please let us pray with you and pray for you. That's what being here is about. If you're here tonight and you've not put Jesus on in baptism, or maybe, just maybe, you need to go back there. Maybe you need to go back to the cross so that you can be the disciple that you need to be. Whatever your need tonight, and I don't know what it is, but the Spirit does. And if you need us tonight, don't leave here tonight without that need being met while we stand and sing together.